In September 2022, we returned to one of the premier warbed air shows in Europe, air legend Paris Villaroche. As usual, there were Second World War aircraft aplenty, one standout being a magnificent Corsair solo display. But this year's focus was on post war aircraft, with an extensive lineup of classic jets on show. Major features in the flying display included a showcase of historic transport aircraft and a Vietnam War display involving a Bronco and Sky Raider. It wasn't all historics though, the modern military turned up as well, not least the French Navy, who dispatched three Rafales in a tribute to Top Gun. This is our pick of the action. Well, what a way that was to get to an air show, and more about that later on. But first, let's get straight into the flying display. We'll be running through Sunday's flying program in the order in which it unfolded. We start with a multifaceted display by the French Navy in a tribute to the French top guns. This display was organised jointly by the airshow organisers and by Paramount Pictures France, for whom we were filming. The display began with a trio of Rafale M's from Flotille 17F based at Londevisio, flying with TF-51D Contrary Mary, representing the P-51D Mustang owned by Tom Cruise. More from the TF-51 later in the programme, but now a second pass from the Rafale trio, this time demonstrating what's known as Buddy Buddy Refueling, the lead aircraft carrying a centerline fuel tank equipped with a hose and drogue system. This was followed by a display of classic Aeronaval air power in what was intended to be a three-ship Cocard Marine display featuring a Breguet Alize, a Fuga Zephyr and a Marine Sonia Paris, although in the event only the Paris could make it to the show. The Paris traces its roots back to 1953 in the MS-755 Fleuret, a prototype two-seat training aircraft intended for use with the French and Indian Air Forces. Neither air arm opted to order the Fleuret, and so Moransonia set about modifying it into a four-seat liaison aeroplane. 
It first flew in 1954 and entered service with the French Air Force and Navy five years later. It was also used by Brazil and Argentina. In fact, the latter operator used the aircraft as a light bomber during the Argentine Navy revolt in 1963. A small number were also sold onto the civilian market, arguably becoming the world's first private jets. The last examples were retired from military service in 2007, but plenty live on in civilian hands, particularly in North America. The final act of the Aeronaval display saw the return of two out of the three Rafales for their regular tactical demonstration. This is not a dedicated display team. It consists of operational pilots and aircraft who practice their show just a few times before an event. But while the choreography of the show might be fairly simple, it's still a very impactful display with plentiful afterburner, the odd puff of vapour and some very attractive manoeuvres. retracting their tail hooks there, the device that not only allows the Rafale M to operate from the Charles de Gaulle, France's own aircraft carrier, but also from the US Navy carriers too, the only foreign-built fighter aircraft permitted to do so. Now repositioning onto the B axis for a split, Both jets will now reposition to approach from the left, one flying at very low speed, the other at very high speed. The Rafale has a top speed of Mach 1.1 at low level and Mach 1.8 at high altitude, but of course this display is fully subsonic today. M was the first variant of the Rafale to enter service and it did so in 2001, five years before the Air Force received their first example. Unusually, the Rafale M's first deployment came several years before it was declared fully operational. That was Operation Enduring Freedom in 2002. Following on from the Rafales, we saw displays by five transport aircraft through the ages, which flew in roughly chronological order. First up, the oldest of the group, the Lockheed Electra Jr.
A smaller version of the more famous L-10 Electra, the Electra Junior first flew in 1936. It was intended for use as a feeder airliner, but it proved too small for practical airline use. Instead, the Electra Junior was mainly used for executive transport, both for oil and steel companies and for the US Army Air Corps, who designated the type the C-40. It was also purchased by the Netherlands for use as a bombing trainer aircraft in the Dutch East Indies, and the British covertly used the type, disguised as a civilian airliner, for photo reconnaissance. Only 130 of these stunning aircraft were built, 70 of those were A models like this one, which were fitted with a pair of 450 horsepower Wasp Junior radial engines. It's owned by Air Legends airshow commentator Bernard Chabert. Next up is perhaps the most famous and consequential military transport aircraft of all time, the C-47 Dakota. While it was developed from the civilian DC-3, which predates the Electra Junior, the first purpose-built military Dakotas didn't fly until 1941. Some 10,000 of them were built, far outstripping the civilian production run of a little over 600 DC-3s. Technically, the name Dakota only refers to 2,000 specific aircraft received by the British and Commonwealth under the Lend-Lease program. Other generic C-47s were known as the Skytrain, the paratroop specialised version was the Sky Trooper, and the gunship version, the Spooky. This aircraft is a flying memorial to the Dakota's most famous exploit, its involvement in Operation Overlord, the D-Day landings in Normandy, when Dakotas, Skytrains and Skytroopers inserted more than 50,000 troops by parachute drop and troop-carrying glider. Next in the transport aircraft showcase was the Nord 2501 Nor Atlas, which first flew in 1949 and was developed to replace Second World War era transport aircraft in French service, including the Dakota. The Nor Atlas was one of the most versatile transport aircraft of its day. It had clamshell doors for easy loading, it had widely spaced landing gear with low pressure tyres and good ground clearance for use on austere runways, and a payload of 7.5 tonnes which represented a small but significant improvement over the Dakota.
The aircraft was used by five air forces, including France, Israel and Germany. Ten civilian aircraft were also produced, the Nord 2502, which were equipped with a pair of small Turbomecha turbojets within the wingtips. More than 400 Nord Atlases rolled off the production line, with the last military examples serving into the 1980s. But despite that, only one remains airworthy today. The fourth and final historic transport aircraft was the Dassault MD-312 Flamon. The Flamon was produced in several different versions and the basic design predates the Noratlas by two years. But this specific variant, the MD-312, first flew in 1950. The basic MD-315 Flamont was designed as a 10-seat transport aircraft. The smaller MD-312 had just six seats and was intended more for use as a pilot trainer, as evidenced by the high visibility orange markings. Another version, the MD-311, was designed as a bombing and navigation trainer, but it was also used in anger during the Algerian War of Independence, becoming the first aircraft type to successfully use wire-guided anti-tank missiles. Time for another French transport aircraft now, but this time we come bang up to date with the Armée de l'Air et de l'Espace Airbus A400M of ET-161 Touraine. Built to replace the C-130 and C-160 with a variety of European customers, the A400M is far newer than anything else we've seen today so far, first flying in 2009. It entered French service in 2013. Now we'll see a very good demonstration of the A400M's carefree handling with a pair of 60 degree wing rocks, the first of which will be conducted at very high speed And the second at very low speed, with flaps and landing gear extended, but still demonstrating a remarkable roll rate nonetheless. It's certainly fair to say that the A400M had a troubled start to its service career. The programme suffered a number of delays and production faults and, to this day, it suffers from relatively poor mission-capable rates. But things are very much improving and the increasing global confidence in the aircraft is seen not only in decisions by countries like France and the UK to retire their older generation of transport aircraft, but also in a small number of new export orders, most recently from Indonesia and Kazakhstan.
Now the aircraft will demonstrate a steep climb in takeoff configuration, demonstrating the immense power provided by its eight-bladed Europrop TP400 engines, producing a combined 44,000 shaft horsepower. That's more than double the power available to the Allison T56-powered C130H Hercules, which France also operates. And that extra power is necessary because while the C-130H can carry a payload of around 19 metric tons, the A-400M can haul 37 tons into the air. Stunning prop vortices there and we'll see more of that during the next manoeuvre as well. a steep climb into a wing over at the maximum permitted bank angle of 120 degrees. Final pass now from the A400M. So we've seen a showcase of transport aircraft through the ages, but now for a brief focus on purpose-built aerobatic aeroplanes. And we'll start with one of the most successful aerobatic aircraft of the 1970s and 80s, the Yak-50, and its twin-seat variant, the Yak-52, flown by the Yakovlevs. The Yakovlevs have been a well-known team on the European airshow circuit for decades, usually flying with four aircraft. Since 2017, they've been capable of flying six ship displays. We saw one such performance in Series 1, Episode 3 from the Zhengzhou airshow. But until now, they've only ever flown as a six ship in China. The six-ship display has quite a different feel from the four ships that we're used to. Much more noise, much more smoke and much more presence. The first half of the show consists of loops in various different formations, generally speaking two loops into wind, a wing over to turn around, one loop downwind. Then the team leaves the display area to change formation before repeating the cycle.
The second half of the show includes some rather more dynamic manoeuvring, and that starts with a very photogenic bomb burst. This is an aircraft type that has two World Aerobatic Championship titles to its name, but to get the best out of the aircraft meant pushing it to its limits. Aircraft of the Soviet aerobatic team were exposed to such high G-forces that they were typically scrapped after just 50 flight hours, and less than a third of the single-seaters still survive, despite their relative youth. Now one final break to conclude the display. And with that we move on to the aircraft that dominates the World Aerobatic Championships today. But not just the dominant aircraft, also the dominant team. The competition aerobatics unit of the French Air Force, the Equipe de Voltige. They have won the team category at seven out of the last eight World Aerobatic Championships. And individual French pilots have won the top prize on five out of those eight occasions, including at this year's contest in Lesno. Half a loop punctuated by half rolls, pushing and pulling positive and negative G alternately. There are currently four pilots within the Equipe de Voltige. Saturday's display was provided by Moulin local Capitaine Victor Lalloué. This is Sunday's show though, flown by Capitaine Geoffrey Denis who joined the Air Force in 2005 and was inducted into the Equipe de Voltige in 2018. Both pilots have their own display sequences, but one manoeuvre which is common to both of them are these approaches towards the crowd on the B-axis, leading into an abrupt negative G push. Surely coming close to the minimum permitted load factor of minus 10 G, showing just how strong that wing is. The wing, spar and integral fuel tanks are all made of carbon fibre. The wing itself can actually sustain plus or minus 24 G. The limiting factors are the pilots and the regulations, not the aircraft. The other interesting thing about this wing design is that it's a symmetrical aerofoil. The top side and the underside of the wings are exactly the same. Most aerofoils are cambered, that means the top produces more lift than the underside. But the extra symmetrical aerofoil means that it flies exactly the same, regardless of whether it is inverted or erect.
The aileron design on the newest generation of extras is also unique. At full deflection, the ailerons extend out of the wing in both directions. They don't just change the camber of the overall aerofoil, they actually generate lift in their own right, helping to whip the aircraft around at in excess of 420 degrees per second. We're about to see a torque roll with the aircraft hanging virtually in the hover for a couple of seconds. This will demonstrate very effectively the power of the Lycoming AIO 580 engine at 315 horsepower. That's only a small increase over the older 300 horsepower engines, but the 330SC has a huge weight advantage over its predecessors and a more advanced propeller with a low weight and wide cord to extract more power at low air speeds. But following that, we move on to something completely different with the Aeronca L3 and the Stinson L5 of Ham and Jam. Ham and Jam is an association that pays tribute to the so-called L-Birds, the light observation aircraft that played a crucial role in shaping the outcome of the Second World War. They have a fleet of six aircraft, two chipmunks, an L3, two L4s and an L5. Described by one German officer as angels of death, these unassuming aeroplanes served initially to provide real-time aerial observations needed to adjust and correct artillery fire. But they were so versatile that they soon found themselves taking on other duties, from light transport to medical evacuation and tactical reconnaissance, often flying alone and unarmed over enemy territory. The name Ham and Jam refers particularly to one mission. They are the radio codes used by Elbird pilots on D-Day to confirm the Allied seizure of two crucial river crossings in Normandy. The next few display items are given over to Second World War fighters. First up, Christophe Jacquard's Spitfire PR-19, flown here by Eric Goujon, joining Nick Gray in the fighter collection's Mark 5B for a thunderous duo display. Good opportunity to enjoy the combined sounds of the Merlin and the Griffin. The Mark V EP120 in the lead, which is one of the most credited Second World War fighters still flying anywhere in the world, having racked up seven 
confirmed kills. Most of those came during her time with 501 Squadron Royal Air Force at Kinloss in Scotland in 1942. After many decades as a static exhibition, EP120 was restored by the fighter collection and returned to flight in 1995. The PR-19, meanwhile, was delivered to the Royal Thai Air Force in 1945. Post-retirement, she too was a static exhibit at the Plains of Fame Air Museum in the USA, but was restored to flight in 2002 and has been based in France since 2005. Another truly excellent two-ship fighter display coming up, this time it's a pair of Warhawks. The lead aircraft once again from the fighter collection and the other from France Flying Warbirds, based here in Milan. The fighter collection's example is one of just two Merlin engine Warhawks still flying. The other is based in Australia and we saw it in Series 5 Episode 1 of Airshow Dispatches which covered Warbirds over Scone 2022. The fighter collection's example was delivered to the United States Army Air Force in 1942, but her service career is a mystery. The next we know, she was dumped in Vanuatu in 1943 and recovered to Australia in the 1970s. She finally flew again in 2011. Rather more is known about the service career of the P-40N5, which flew with the 7th Fighter Group in Papua New Guinea. She was abandoned in the forest and, once again, recovered to Australia in the 1970s. Restoration to flight was completed in 2002 and, two years later, Robert Warren, the aircraft's wartime pilot, visited the country to see her fly. She was then brought to France in 2007.
The P-40 was a reliable and dependable fighter, but it wasn't exactly blessed with outstanding manoeuvrability or power. The next slot, however, featured two of the finest fighters that the United States produced during the Second World War, the Thunderbolt and the Mustang. These two aircraft come from fighter aircraft engineering and ultimate warbird flights respectively and together they make up half of the ultimate fighters aerobatic team which we enjoyed at Air Legend in 2021. This year it's just a two ship display followed by solo aerobatics from each aircraft in turn. It's hard to believe when looking at it, but the P-47 was originally conceived as a lightweight interceptor fighter. But during the development period, the aircraft grew and grew in no small part to accommodate its enormous R-2800 double wasp radial engine. And the result was the heaviest single engine piston fighter ever produced. Fully loaded, the P-47 weighs over eight tons. That's equivalent to over three fully loaded Spitfire Mark I's. After entering service, it was found that the P-47 particularly excelled in the ground attack role, and this is perhaps what it is most famous for today. About 15,000 P-47s were built and a similar number of this aircraft were produced, the iconic P-51 Mustang. Envisaged as a more powerful, more capable successor to the P-40, the Mustang was originally developed for the Royal Air Force. It was a good interceptor fighter from the outset, but the aircraft performed poorly at high altitude. The integration of a Spitfire Mark IX's Merlin 66 engine solved this, and the result was one of the most widely used, versatile and historically significant aircraft of the Second World War, used perhaps most famously as an escort fighter. Thank <laughs> you. 
The next pair of fighters performed consecutively rather than together, perhaps as a result of France's new airshow regulations, which have placed rather impractical rehearsal requirements on multi-aircraft performances. The Yak-3 and Yak-11 pair pays tribute to the 80th anniversary of the Normandy Niemen, a squadron of French pilots who flew with the Soviet Air Force after France's surrender. The squadron was founded in 1942, originally equipped with the Yak-1, and scored some 86 kills from just 25 losses in their first campaign. A second campaign followed in 1944. On the first day they claimed 29 kills and zero losses. By the end of the year they were actually based inside German territory and had chalked up more than 200 kills. A third campaign in 1945 saw them using Yak-3s like this one, an aircraft which some squadron members even considered to be superior to the Spitfire and Mustang. Most Yak-3s were fitted with inline engines, usually the Klimov VK-105, but later in the development process, Yakovlev began experimenting with radial engines, specifically the Shvetsov Ash-82. Shortly after the end of the war, Yakovlev produced a twin-seat training version of the radial engine Yak-3, and two years later, that design was further refined to create this, the Yak-11, one of the most heavily used piston engine trainers of its era. This specific aircraft was built under license by Let of Czechoslovakia. It was delivered to the Czechoslovak Air Force in 1948, but allegedly they never flew it. At some point, it ended up in Egypt, an abandoned wreck in the desert. In 1982, it and 41 others were acquired by a group of enthusiasts and brought back to Europe. It was restored just down the road at La Ferté Allée and flew again in 1987. It's now based here in Milan. On to our final Second World War pairing now. First into the air, the Catalina Society's PBY 5A Catalina, followed by the F4U Corsair of the Amical Jean-Baptiste Salis. They start their performance with a formation fly past before splitting into solo displays. The Catalina now begins a fairly short solo routine, just a few passes, this one with wingtip floats extended. Having featured this aircraft so many times in airshow dispatches, it was a real privilege to be able to join them for their transit flights to and from Paris.
That is the subject of a separate mini feature in which you can join me on two of those four flights. It's not the most polished of productions, just one camera giving you a first person view of what it's like to ride aboard this aircraft. But nonetheless, it's available for you to enjoy at a link in the video description. But now it's the turn of one of the most distinctive American fighters of the Second World War, the Corsair, diving in to start an absolutely tremendous display. This was an aircraft that saw outstanding success in the Pacific theatre, achieving the highest kill ratio of any Allied fighter. But it wasn't without its flaws, it was notoriously difficult to fly and suffered from an appalling safety record. This particular example flew not during the Second World War, but in the Korean War. It wasn't delivered until 1951. Subsequent to that, the aircraft served with the Honduran Air Force, including in the Football War in 1969, also known as the Hundred Hour War. That was a brief military clash between Honduras and El Salvador, which coincided with unrest caused by a World Cup qualifying match. She was sold onto the civilian market in 1979 and has been part of the Amical Jean-Baptiste Salis since the mid-80s. It's flown here in impeccable style by Jean-Baptiste's son, Baptiste Salis. An absolutely fantastic display, one of the best Warbird solos I can remember seeing in recent years. But now onto something every bit as enjoyable as we move on to the Vietnam War. First up, the OV-10B Bronco of the Musée Européen de l'Aviation de Chasse de Montélimar. And following that, this Moulin-based AD-4N Sky Raider from France Flying Warbirds and the pair join up in formation before commencing their solo displays.
The Bronco project was launched in 1963. The requirement was for an armed reconnaissance aircraft for the US Marine Corps. But as the Air Force and Navy joined the program, the focus shifted to a more offensive platform, capable of carrying out counterinsurgency. The result is an aircraft that is entirely unique, one that offered excellent manoeuvrability for the ground attack role, good visibility for the observation role, and a large cargo capacity for various other duties, from medical evacuation to forward air control. Broncos were deployed in large numbers during the Vietnam War, around half of which were lost over the course of the conflict. They were retired from the US Air Force in 1991, but two were briefly reactivated in 2015, flying close air support missions in Iraq and Syria. This variant, the OV-10B, was produced specifically for West Germany for use as a target tug although this one has been restored to look like a US Marine Corps A-model Bronco used during Operation Desert Storm. Now, the turn of the Sky Raider, a remarkable post-war carrier-based aircraft which first flew in 1946. The Sky Raider was first used during the Korean War, where its weapons payload and 10-hour mission endurance far outclassed the early jets, and come the start of the Vietnam War, the Sky Raider was still the primary medium attack aircraft for US forces. Although not designed as a fighter, the Sky Raider was armed with a cannon and successfully claimed two air-to-air -air kills against much faster and more manoeuvrable MiG-17s over the course of the conflict. This particular Sky Raider is a veteran of the Korean War. It was then sold to the French Air Force and later to Chad, who used it in combat during the Chad-Libya conflict in the late 1970s. The aircraft, still airworthy, was flown back to France by a group of enthusiasts in 1988 and has been based here at Moulin ever since then. But from now on, the flying display begins to centre around classic jets, and we start with an aircraft type that flew just one year after the Sky Raider, the F-86 Sabre. The Sabre rose to prominence during the Korean War where they chalked up a 6 to 1 kill ratio against North Korean MiG-17s.
Nearly 10,000 Sabres were produced, and they were operated by around 30 nations across a number of conflicts, making it one of the first truly successful mass production jet aircraft. This is a Canadian licensed built Sabre, a CL-13B Mark VI, roughly equivalent to the F-86E and generally considered to be the best variant of the Sabre ever produced. Not least because it was equipped with the Avro Arenda 14 engine, which was more reliable and 50% more powerful than the engines used in the original American versions. This aircraft was acquired by famed Warbird pilot Frederick Ackery in 2019 in exchange for his beloved P-51D Mustang. Of the 12 Sabres still flying worldwide, this is the only one in Europe. More jets coming up in a moment, but before that, the very first Spanish contribution to the air show here in Milan. This is Formacion Quixote, flying two Cessna 337s. Introduced in 1965, the Cessna 337 is a twin-engine, push-pull configured civilian utility aircraft. You might wonder why Cessna developed a push-pull aircraft rather than mounting one engine on either wing, as is more conventional. This was partly a safety decision. If one engine fails on a conventional twin, the asymmetrical power causes the aircraft to yaw towards the failed engine, and that can make it very difficult to control. If one engine fails on the Skymaster, the aircraft continues flying as usual, just with a reduction in power. The aircraft makes a rather unique sound, as you can hear. That's because the rear propeller sits within the turbulent prop wash generated by the front propeller. It's a phenomenon not entirely different to the blade slap we hear from the Chinook, but occurring at a much higher RPM. These two aircraft are painted as US Air Force O2s. That's the US military designation for the aircraft. They primarily use the Sky Raider for observation and forward air control. 
but in fact, these are ex-Portuguese Air Force units, modified for the light attack role with four underwing hardpoints that could carry a combination of machine gun pods, rocket launchers and light bombs. Classic and current military jets make up the rest of the program and taxiing out to the runway now is a CT-133 Silver Star representing the earliest generation of jet trainers. The CT-133 is the Canadian license-built version of the American T-33 Shooting Star, a jet trainer that first flew in 1948. It's effectively a two-seat stretched version of the P-80, the first operational jet fighter in the US military. But while the P-80 was retired from American service within 15 years, eclipsed by newer, faster and more powerful fighters, the T-33 remained relevant for far longer. The US Air Force slowly replaced the T-33 in the mainstream training role in the early 1960s, but it remained a more specialised training platform until 1975. The Bolivian Air Force, meanwhile, continued to operate their T-33s well into the 21st century, upgrading them in around 2001 before finally retiring them in 2017. This specific aeroplane was built in 1954 and served with the Royal Canadian Air Force. After retirement, she was kept in a taxiable condition at a museum in London, Ontario. It's now owned by flight experience company Top Gun Voltige, who also operate aircraft such as the L-39, Super Stearman, Epsilon and Gamebird. Now for what's known in France as a passage anglais, or an English fly-past. We'd call it a photographer-pleasing topside. And it's always a little odd hearing it referred to as an English fly-past, given the French are rather better at it than we are. These silver jets look absolutely fantastic in the late afternoon light at Milan, by which point the sun is almost directly behind the crowd. And now here's another, the DH-100 Vampire FB-6. Another lovely English fly-past to open the display in this, the second British jet to enter service, which it did in 1946, just after the end of the war. Uh -huh. 
This is a single-seat fighter-bomber version of the Vampire, one of 175 FB6s to be built in the UK, although another 400 were built under licence in Sweden and Switzerland. In total, around 4,500 Vampires were built, and they served with more than 30 countries. Vampires were the first jet aircraft to cross the Atlantic, the first jets to be operated by an aerobatic display team, the first jet to land on an aircraft carrier, and at one point they also set the world altitude record just a whisker below 60,000 feet. Perhaps the most common type of classic jet on the airshow circuit worldwide is the L-39 Albatross. Designed in the late 1960s as the primary jet trainer for the Warsaw Pact, I say classic jet and that is perhaps a little demeaning because the L-39 is very much still in service with more than 30 nations who operate the aircraft either as a trainer or in some cases as a light attack platform. It's also still in development. The L-39NG first flew just four years ago, intended to replace original L-39s with operators around the world. Truth be told though, it's seen very modest sales success so far. There are several hundred L-39s flying in civilian hands worldwide, and they've been used by a number of high-profile aerobatic teams in recent years. This is one of them, Fly and Fun, and they're running in now on the B-axis for an opposition break. One aircraft out to either side, they'll now turn back towards us for opposing half Cubans. Crossing and pulling up into two-third loops. Shortly after apexing, they'll both perform a half roll into a wreck flight, level out the dive and cross again. Then they'll pull up for a second time for synchronised barrel rolls. The team was founded in 2015, initially under the name Team Sparflex. They're based in Rheim, from where they offer formation aerobatic experience flights. And now they pull up for the final break.
Well, we enjoyed several long-defunct classic jet designs, then we had the still-in-service L39, and now we come bang up to date with the Rafale solo display of the French Air and Space Force. This is one of the very finest fast jet solos in the world and it will give quite an insight into the Rafale's epic manoeuvrability. Immediately there you'll see the aircraft has an enormously impressive roll rate of 270 degrees per second which is the fastest of any comparable 4th or 5th generation fighter. The first half of this display involves a lot of action on the B-axis with the jet flying directly towards the crowd. Here it comes again, rolling into an outside turn at negative 3G. And then snapping into positive G, 9G, which the aircraft can achieve in just one second. And that G will now be decreasing, the power comes down, the airspeed bleeds away, and the aircraft returns towards us at its approach speed of 120 knots for a missed approach. M88 engines designed specifically for the Rafale, two reheated turbofans producing a combined 34,000 pounds of thrust as the aircraft approaches again for a pair of loaded rolls. In on the B-axis one last time, two and a quarter rolls and a wing rock to end the show. Well, follow that. Actually, that's a task that these guys are more than up to. We stick with the Armée de l'Air et de l'Espace. It's time now for the final display of Air Legend 2022. And it is, of course, the Patrouille de France. More so than most teams, the Patrouille de France vary their display routine from one year to the next, and this year's show is quite different to last year's. But one thing never changes, this is one of the most imaginative and artistic aerobatic teams on the planet.
collapsing into a tight Diamond formation over the top of the loop. The eight Alpha Jets repositioned for their first pass by the crowd. Red, white and blue smoke will shortly come on. All eight jets can smoke white. Athos 1, 2, 6 and 8 can also smoke blue. Athos 3, 4, 5 and 7 smoke red. looping in losange formation and during the next loop the shape will change to grand flesh big arrow Back in Diamond for a wing over to reposition. Uh, the Patois de France do these repositions exceptionally well. The Red Arrows, for example, do low, flat repositions that take the same amount of time but carry the team much further from the spectators. The Patois de France, meanwhile, go for these tall, graceful wing overs, using height to reduce the lateral distance travelled and keep the jets much closer to the crowd. twisting this loop through 90 degrees to create a quarter clover, apexing towards us and departing on the B-axis to our front. And coming up next, a new manoeuvre introduced ahead of the 2023 display season, which will mark the team's 70th anniversary. The team was officially formed in 1953, and so, to commemorate that, the team splits into a five ship and a three ship before both elements turn back towards us for the five three cross. Like the Rafale we saw earlier, the Alpha Jet has exceptional performance in roll. Athos 7 performing a four point hesitation roll, and Athos 8 barrel rolling around him. Now a manoeuvre not seen for several years, reintroduced this season Le Sharif. For a lot of teams, a knife edge pass is a manoeuvre in its own right. Here, it's just part of a four ship formation pass. And if that's not enough for you, Athos 2 and 3 perform rollbacks into fusée formation. The box avant is Athos 1, 2, 3, and 4. They always fly as a group. Whereas Athos 5, 6, 7 and 8 make up the box arrière. They fly the more dynamic splits, crosses and synchronised aerobatics. And indeed they approach now for the Big Bang.
A very good view of top rudder being used by the two jets flying in the knife edge. The tail providing all the lift needed to stop the aircraft losing altitude. Now, a very impressive new manoeuvre. Six aircraft perform a stunning roll under break. What a truly exceptional performance that was as the team prepare to close Air Legend 2022 with their final split. As the Patrouille de France taxi back in, we look ahead to our next show, the Aerospace Valley Air Show at Edwards Air Force Base, which will certainly be an event for the history books. We'll see you then, but from me, Adam Landau, thank you very much for watching, and goodbye for now.